Okay, welcome back. We are now diving into the step-by-step -step design uh, using Ceric Omnicam of a Thai based restoration. Um, hopefully you've been keeping up with me. Please feel free to pause, rewind, go back, connect with me directly if you have any questions about what's happening. I am always happy to give you my input, my feedback. This is good stuff. Uh, so it's rather technical, it's a little bit complicated, so bear with me. Um, the nice thing is these videos you should be able to watch as many times as you want. So first and foremost, um, like I said a moment ago, this gets pretty technical, pretty complicated. Um, once you're to this point, you hopefully will have realized that you need a very solid grasp on um, CEREC basics before we move on to the kind of the advanced uh, advanced levels of CEREC, which, which uh, CEREC and Tybase uh, requires. But that being said, this is not something that is exclusive to just a few of us being able to do this. Um, designing an implant restoration with CEREC using Tybase or scan posts, this is something that anybody can do once you've got the right amount of experience and know what you're doing. So pay special attention to the details as we're going through here. As I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you take time away from patients to invest in appropriately designing, um, taking the time to know what you're doing so that you're not sweating when the patient's sitting there watching you. So this is the whole entire process um, of the design and I'm gonna walk you through it here, okay? So the workflow is, is this design is 13 minutes. Um, you'll notice that I'm selecting multi-layer abutment. Then we're going to select biogeneric individual. The material is Emax CAD that I'm using for both the framework and the veneering structure. Um, once I select the framework and the veneering structure material, I'm going to tell it I'm using a tie base and it's going to have me select who makes the tie base. That's Serona. And then you've got to specifically select the type of tie base that you're using. Okay, this is really critical. Uh, you have to make sure, like I said before, that you're using exactly the right tie base size for your implant platform. They are not interchangeable, except in very rare circumstances. So we're gonna image. Now I have a typodont here with an extracted tooth held in with some, my tie base rather, is held in with some uh, blue bite. Um, so I'm taking a few minutes to scan and you'll notice how little time I take to scan. I've found in my experience that the less time you take to scan correlates to a much faster process. As long as you have the right amount of data, you don't really need to take five hours to scan. Now this is the opposing arch. Um, you'll notice I'm spending a lot less time scanning this. Again, this is the type on, it's a lot simpler. Generally in the mouth, it'll take an extra 10 or 15 seconds per arch because I'm gonna spend a little bit drying the tissue off, but that's about it. That's my finger there. And then we're gonna get the bite. Um, it, one thing should be noted here, oftentimes we can't really get a bite with this tie base in place. So I would suggest that before you start your tie base process, you go ahead and get the bite before you put the tie base in. Now you notice how I added this gingival mask. I went over here to add, added the gingival mask. Um, and I'm re-scanning over here. You don't necessarily have to. I could have just taken this one, dragged it over there and hit copy. Um, and a lot of people when they're doing the gingival mask will actually take the tie base out. Um, and there's a reason for that. We'll get to that here in a second. Uh, inspect the models, make sure you have the data that you need. Um, you'll notice that imaging process took just a couple of minutes. Now the computer is gonna take a while and think. And this is where you really learn um, how much how much time too much data will take. Uh, it takes forever to do this model calculating if, you have, calculating if you have too much data. So if you've spent 10 minutes imaging and you've got this giant log of images, you're gonna have a heck of a time um, getting the computer through the step. It'll get through the step, but it's gonna take forever doing it. So less is more, but you have to have a, the, the right amount of imaging, okay? And while this is thinking, this is a pretty good amount of time for a single tie based restoration design. It's a pretty good amount of time. Um, you don't want to take too long, um, but you don't want to you don't want to zip through this too fast. 
Um, as I mentioned to most of the other students that I train with CEREC, there's a lot of things that you can do digitally that you could do 10 times faster with a handpiece after the, the restoration is milled. All right, so that, that's decent modeling. You notice I've got a little bit of detritus here and here, and of course these are stitched together a little bit, but generally that's pretty clean. That should do the, the job that we needed to do. Okay, so next step, set the model axis. I'm gonna position it where I need it to be. Um, rotate it so that the occlusal plane is roughly in line with these horizontal lines here. Um, generally speaking, you've got an area for molars, premolars, and anterior teeth. So you hit set model axis, and then you gotta go next. So you gotta hit, there's a confirmation step there. And then we're gonna trim the area. There are a couple of philosophies. Some docs go in and trim out like this. And others of us will just circle around the tie base. Either way works. I would suggest trying to be as conservative as you can because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a trough all through there. Once you've trimmed it, um, you're gonna click the scan body head. And that's right at the tip of the pyramid. And then we're gonna get the edit baseline. This edit baseline step is basically you're telling the computer where the emergence from the tissue is. Um, this can be edited later, um, so we're not necessarily too worried about making this perfect, um, but I would suggest that you spend some time making sure that it's easy to work with. Where it was before, all conglomerated around the tie base, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, so clean it up a little bit, make it look more like a natural tooth emergence profile before you move to the next step. And there's the gouge, you can see this gouge through there. So this next step is unique to tie base, and you'll notice the joystick up here is controlling the angulation of the path of insertion. So this is different from your standard individual crown or bridge or veneer or inlay or onlay where you're rotating the model to determine the insertion path. You're actually using a joystick with a tie base. So here are the parameters. I wouldn't touch these, just leave them alone. There's no reason for you to adjust them. Um, so just hit next and then it's gonna give us a proposal. And with 4.4, most of the proposals are pretty good, assuming you've done all your steps right. Um, at this point, you'll determine if you had a tie base or a scan post. Um, if you've made an error, you'll, you'll get a big error at this point um, in the design process if you had a scan post and used a tie base or vice versa in the programming. So, a couple of things to remember. Always start your adjusting and editing from big to small. Always, always, always. Never go in with a smooth tool and start that first. Always position and rotate first. Um, scale first. Um, now we have this feature called BioJaw. So at this point, if I don't like it, I can go right here to BioJaw um, and go ahead and get a completely brand new proposal based on me putting the tooth where I want it to be. But you'll notice I start with the position and rotate tool and then the scale tool or the uh, shape tool. The circular shape tool is my favorite tool out of all of them. I'm going to generally position it where it needs to be. And then I'm going to do a little bit of smoothing kind of last. And we're, we're going to break it up into two areas. There's super gingival and sub gingival when you're talking about tie base restorations. Super gingival, we're going to go ahead and do some editing and then we're going to smooth it. Subgingively, we're going to smooth it first and then do some editing. Okay, so now I'm going to go to smooth and you see all these weird lumps here. I'm going to go ahead and smooth those out because um, that basically followed the contour of the typodont that I had, which was a little jagged. With your, ideally with your patients and their natural gingival tissue healing and the healing abutments they've had in place, um, this will already be smooth in these areas. So you're going to want to smooth it real quick make sure it's nice and smooth, and then go in and edit it. And that's when that gingival mask, this lower gingiva, becomes really critical because that'll tell you where that contact is. If you just go in and turn on the lower jaw right in here, then it'll still have that gouge through it, which we had in there before. So there's the gouge. You can't really see where it is in relation to the tissue. Now there's my lower gingiva, the gingival mask picture that I took. So I can see where it orients. And you can see we've got a little gap in here. I don't like gaps, you don't want gaps. So I'm gonna to go to my circular shape tool. I'm gonna to make that a little bit bigger with the size over here. And I'm gonna pull that gap closed. If you were to have a gap 
between your restoration and the patient's gingiva, you're in trouble. I mean, that's a recipe for a failed implant right there. You wanna make sure you have a positive, not too tight, but a positive tissue cuff to prevent gunk and plaque and bacteria and saliva and too much yucky stuff to get down in between the restoration and the gingiva. All right, so at this point, if we're happy with the design, if we're happy with the contacts, the occlusion, we're happy with everything, you can go ahead and go forward to mill. Now, realizing this is a hybrid abutment crown. This is a screw-retained restoration. I set this case up as a two-piece restoration, as a custom abutment, a separate restoration. So where do we get to that? How can I split this? What's the split process? Right here, see that split, unsplit? So we're gonna go ahead and click on split. And then that take, get, brings us back to our baseline. Now you remember when we adjusted that baseline right out of the gate, now we can adjust it again. Now this becomes where our split is between the abutment and the crown. Now be cautious because this will actually follow the tissue. If you start to edit it, it'll actually start clicking on the tissue and you can track it around into weird places. Um, so as you're editing, double click to start, double click to end, uh, but you want to make sure that baseline is where you want it to be. Some uh, docks like the baseline super gingivally slightly in certain areas and sub gingivally in other areas. Some like the baseline perfectly circular all the way around. Some like a dip down in the interproximal or a, an elevation in the interproximal. You see how it follow the gingival uh, contours? So you want to be careful um, where you're clicking. And then sometimes I'll actually go over here and turn off the lower jaw and the, the gingiva so that I can see a little bit better where that um, line is. So we're editing the baseline, um, and the baseline again is generally where the abutment meets the crown restoration. Uh, this can be edited over and over and over again. You can actually go ahead and apply the split, take a look at it, then you can unsplit it, and then you can hit split again and re-edit this line. The nice thing about the Cerex software is it looks like they've accommodated us those of us dentists who like to change things over and over and over. All right, so that's my apply. Remember before I hit split and it showed up the line and then you hit apply to make it happen. So there's actually your split. Remember how I mentioned the Cerec machine, the software does a great job of creating a nice shoulder for you. Beautiful shoulder. But we have to be cautious about the minimal thickness. All right, be very cautious about the minimal thickness with regard to your design, because sometimes the computer will give you a restoration that is too thin. Okay, now we're moving forward. Um, it's telling me there that it optimized the position for the sprue. You can see the sprue right here. Um, re realizing, remembering that there's a notch inside the block. Okay, now ignore what I'm doing here. The current version of the software will not allow me to move the sprue um, so just pretend you're not seeing this right now. Apparently, uh, Serona uh, decided they did not want to allow us to move that sprue. Maybe it was throwing people off. I thought it was awesome. Um, but there is a notch inside the block, a groove rather, inside the block that meshes with the notch that's on the tie base. So it will only orient with the tie base one way. All right, and there's the crown. Now remember I said minimal thickness? Look at all that thin area. Why would the computer give me a proposal of an area that's too thin like that? Well, let's go back to design and let's fix that. So, first thing I wanna do is try to bulk these out, make sure that we, we surpass the minimal thickness uh, that is indicated by the manufacturer. Sometimes we can do that by just adding to the crown. Other times you have to actually shorten the abutment that's underneath the crown. So, ideally we wanna leave the abutment where it is if possible, but Editing, editing the abutment's not a big deal. It's really not a big deal. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So there's my crown proposal. You can see everything's nice and rounded and flowing internally. The software is awesome at doing that. And we can go down here and we can switch between the crown and the abutment, the separate abutment. So this crown can be milled out of a regular block. It won't mill out of a block, you know, one of the 16L blocks that has a hole in it. It won't mill out of a block like that. 
Now this abutment on the other hand needs a 14 millimeter, a 14 L block. You can't mill it out of a 16. It has to be a 14 L block. Um, so you got to make sure you have the MO blocks, which we talked about in one of the previous lectures. Um, otherwise this hybrid abutment, and it's just the abutment, but the hybrid abutment will not mill and you'll be up a creek. Again, it's important that we have all the parts and pieces that we need. So you need an abutment block if you're doing a separate abutment and you need a crown block if you're doing a, a crown. We can mill that out of anything. It doesn't have to be Emacs. All right, so now the machine is positioning um, and we're done with the design process. Now you can see I got a little blue and that's okay. It's not too big of a deal. I'm not too worried about it. But that in a nutshell is a 13 and a half minute um, walk through of the design process. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this video here. Um, you've seen the whole video, the whole process, realizing you can design a single crown in a single, you know, 10 or 15 minute design uh, sitting. Um, so the next video will actually dig into each of those individual steps and talk through them one more time so that you know exactly what you're doing when it comes time to do it. All right, thank you again for watching.